This is Joost Vergraaf from Coriomanic and Pestilence, and you are listening to Brutalicious Broadcast. I mean, Brutally Delicious Broadcast. <laughs> Sorry, we're late. Rena fucked everything up and we're running behind. So no worries. No worries. <laughs> That's my partner. How are you doing? <laughs> Hi. Hi, Joost. Is that how I pronounce your name? Yeah, Joost. It's a, it's a typical Dutch name. So Joost. That's Joost. what it is. <laughs> Sounds <Nice>. good. <laughs> now, cool. How are you today, Joost? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. It was a bit of a rough day, but uh, yeah, but I'm fine. Thanks. What's been going on? Tell us about your day. Well, it was also fun, but uh, it was like hard and fun at the same time. I have uh, like a one-year-old uh, daughter at home here. And uh, yeah, and uh, my wife's working on Tuesday, so I'm taking care of her. And um, yeah, today she just wouldn't sleep. So I was uh, running around all the time. And uh, but, uh, but we also had fun. So, And this is an yeah. exciting week for you, right? Because the record comes out in, what, three days or something? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's awesome. Looking forward. So for yeah. those not familiar, it's going to be a self-titled record. And what, um, this is very different from stuff you've done in, you know, Pestilence. Is this, uh, have you always been interested in those sort of uh, genres as well? Well, I, I've, I've been playing different uh, styles of music for a long time, but um, like the records that were put out and, and came out um, uh, everywhere, and th those were always metal. So, but, but I also did like stand in things in, in like, uh, even, I mean, different genres like soul or funk or, uh, or blues or all kinds of stuff, you know? So, so I also did that, but, um, yeah, so, but, but the official releases are all metal, I guess. So, yeah. So, but, but at the point where I just started creating something out of the blue, like straight from the heart, this is just what came out. So that's it. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. Yeah, I, I do that. And all that comes out is country. And I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you know? awesome. But tell me, tell me about your um, love for funk. Where did that begin? Um, well, I guess when, when you pick up a bass, well, I, I also teach bass. And, and when I get when I get new students, all they want to do is they want to play like this, you know, they all go like, they want to hit the bass like that. It's just yeah, something they want to do. Yeah, yeah, it's a technique. So I was when I started playing bass, I was pretty soon getting into these into this technique and checking out um, um, the, the the typical funk players back then. That was in the uh, late eighties. You had uh, pop bands like Level Forty Two and, and things like that. And later on, you had Primus. And um, I just wanted to explore that. And uh, but but in in um, in reality, in bands. As soon as I tried playing like that, they were like, can you please stop doing that and, right. and just play like you should, you know? And um, uh, But I always kept doing that. And sometimes I, I use it in recordings, but never in a real, in a, in a, in a band situation. So when I uh, wanted to do something just for to have fun with uh, uh, during the first lockdown here in the Netherlands, I decided to use this technique as a starting point and also to use it uh, without any guitars. So, so then you have also kind of a riff uh, function of the bass, where normally you have guitars, obviously. So it's the bass and the keys, and um, so yeah. So, so that's just uh, I, I just I, I didn't think about it too much. It's just what what happened, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's awesome. So you also teach. Yes. Uh, bass mm -hmm. is that yep. something that takes up a lot of your time? No, it's, it's like. It, it's two ahead. days in a week, something like that, in a, in a, in a music school uh, nearby. And sometimes I do Zoom uh, stuff with uh, Zoom, but uh, I find that um, harder. I mean, it's possible. It can work. It depends on the connection, on the technique and stuff like that. And um, but but it, it, it always works better if you can really. Uh, yeah, if you're in the same room like that, you know, so uh, so two days in a week I teach. Nice. So I was so it's basically right. anybody, anybody who, sorry, Bruce, anybody who enrolls into that music school can come learn bass from you then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I still have some, so I, I have like these two blocks for how you say it. And, 
and there, there's still some space. So, um, but but as soon as it, it's full, then I cannot take any more students. So, right. but at this point, yeah, I can have some more students. Yeah. Are you finding this uh, this project, or maybe it's too early to tell because it's only been a single or two out? But are you finding Pestilence fans kind of migrating over to it because of yourself, or is this a, a whole separate audience and listenership? I think the the the, the, that, the the last thing you say. I think that's the case because um, yeah, some people they they may show interest because of uh, because of my uh, me being part of Pestilence, but um, as soon as they hear they hear no guitars, they hear hardly any vocals, and they hear horns. And that's that's tough for the metalheads, you know. <laughs> I totally get that. So so some people they're open-minded. Uh, I like, like I didn't like I said I didn't think too much about anything at all, like anything like a target audience. But but um, uh, the publisher John Usher he threw out some lines in the prog uh, scene, and there were some people who really uh, appreciated my music and in the prog scene. But in the metal scene, especially the death metal, thrash metal scene, uh, not not too many people uh, are into this. <laughs> yeah. I get it. And I saw reading your bio when you mentioned it, there's there's horns in this. So I mean, that's a surprise to you know, most of the heavier fans, but you had never written horns before. How did you even come up with that? And what was it like trying to do it? Well, it was uh, it was an experiment, actually. And, and um, like I, I've like I said, I, I've, I play different styles in different situations apart from metal, but I also listen to a lot of uh, early funk and 70s Bay Area funk. From the states i love that sound it's a certain sound it's pretty rough and pretty uh unpolished and really i right. love that sound and there are a lot of horns there that are really to the point and i guess the fact that i've listened to this music a lot i guess that helped but so i just hear in my head what what i would like to uh have on the music and i just use the the keyboard and uh and uh media stuff to 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 write it and then uh and that's it and then it takes some some rearranging later, but but yeah, it works well. Gotcha. Oh. You know? Yeah. No, this sounds awesome. So where can people find you? Are you well, active on social media or like what what what's your major major channels or main channels of interacting with your fans? Yeah. Well for the music it's Bandcamp. Uh Bandcamp is where you can purchase the physical C D or or buy the uh electronic uh, the the digital uh, thing. And um, yeah, I'm on social, so Instagram, Facebook, Corio Manic, you can't miss it. And um, yeah, so am I miss, oh yeah, of course, YouTube. So I'm just getting started with the YouTube stuff. And, but uh, yeah, I think I have those things. So it uh, shouldn't be too hard to reach out. Any plans to take cool. this live at all? Definitely. Well, actually today I got asked to play a festival. Uh, it's my first, it's the first uh, gig request, so to speak. And um yeah. So and 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 but the, because the thing is here in the Netherlands, things are getting uh, are just opening up at this point. Yeah. So I yeah. just today I heard that festival is going to be there. Uh, so so all the uh, promoters, everybody's really busy, you know, all of a sudden because uh, it, it looks good. So um, um, yeah. So I got a first gig request and I had to call guys. And say, can you can you uh, do, do you have time on that date and stuff? Um, and and um so yeah so that that looks good and now i'm thinking about uh how i should do this and i'm working on a live show and uh that's going to be really cool because uh it's not like i'm going to play the songs as they are with a band and that's just it we're going to take the songs as a starting point and then and then make a big party in a way like a high energy crazy things i got a percussion player a friend of mine who's awesome percussion player he, he will be joining the band as well so we're gonna build something i'm not sure yet what it will look like exactly but it's going to be fun for sure you mentioned that's it, amazing it is and you mentioned dancing sorry rena but medieval dancing plagues is in your bio what the heck is that yeah well that's just something i got into uh, uh somewhere in in 2018 uh, i came across this this topic and i started reading studies on it and it's crazy it's just it's just so cool because it's an unsolved mystery from history and it's also something that has a clear parallel i believe uh with the times uh, in which we live now um because it has to do with i think it's like a psychosis a collective or a mass psychosis where people just let out something and 
they, they had been under pressure for centuries, literally, uh, the church, uh, inquisition, the fear of God, stu uh, superstition that I mentioned, um, black plague, all these things are really uh, uh, have a, you know, there's like, so, so the people were really, uh, how do you say, under a lot of pressure. And then somehow it came out and uh, people started dancing to the music they heard in, in their heads. And, mm. um, and, and it was uh, infectious. So other people started join them and it was just crazy and and then musicians even attend you know got got involved to started playing and people started selling food so actually it were like the, the first festivals i guess in the middle ages uh but, but especially hey nice dog okay. <laughs> i have to say though yeah look he's been <laughs> totally participating today but nice. you know this, this whole dancing madness thing it wasn't just like an awesome festival or if it were then everybody at coachella would die at the end of the festival, oh, right. <laughs> that, that was the thing, <laughs> you know, that they just danced, so, so, and danced and danced for days, maybe for a week, and they would just die. Crazy, right? It's true. Yeah. It's true. So it was, it has, but, but exactly, exactly. But that's what I find so fascinating. There was something there. It was like a relief to a lot of people. And, and it was also, um, uh, it was also, yeah, fun in a way to, for people that like attended these, these things. But of course, there was a dark side. People died from exhaustion and dehydration, and and it was because of uh, uh, of people being uh, how do you say um, how do you say that? What's the word uh, under pressure? That's not the word I'm looking for. Um, well, well, anyway, you know what I mean. Like the people just were they needed to get out of something. So, but yeah. but and that's what I find fascinating. And also, like I said, the parallel to these times. It's uh, to me, it's very clear. Uh, a lot of people in the in the free countries of the world, they've been under a lot of pressure in the past uh, couple of years. So it feels like something has to get out, something like that. Yeah, that that I can completely agree on. But it's this is an interesting thing. I'm I'm super like into all these like ancient mysteries and un unsolved <laughs> thingies in, in the human history. And this is a really interesting one because you know that it, it started. Mm -hmm out small but then it started gathering a lot of people and and that like you know raises the question of like how many of those people were actually sort of affected by the illness psychosis or, or whatever was the root cause of, of the forest dancing because it wasn't like i'm just gonna go and boogie it's like they had no choice <laughs> you know like they couldn't stop even they if they wanted to yeah. so so that that was that was the thing. So like you know the whole yeah. like how many people actually just started doing it because everybody else was doing it. They weren't like feeling the compulsion of doing it, but they just joined because they didn't want to be left out. And how many of those people just fucking died for <laughs> peer pressure, basically? You know. I don't it's know, but it's it's really really interesting because yeah, um, because there's this thing. Where people, I mean, psychosis in general has an infectious uh, kind of nature, if you know what I mean. Like sometimes, I mean, people in a relationship, often when one of the two gets a psychosis, the other one gets like infected and just goes along in this psychosis, right? So there's something right. really interesting going on there. And some people argue that that is exactly the way religion works, which is, yeah. of course, a dangerous topic. But okay, so so it's just a theory. But yeah. It's 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 uh, really interesting. I, uh, so so, but I see you also like this uh, stuff. So that's uh, that's cool. So so yeah. yeah to get back to the, the question. So, so I was into this this thing, and then I just thought it would make sense to use the term choreomanic, the word choreomanic, which would be a, a, a person uh, suffering from choreomania, which is the disease, right? So yeah. So and also because of the high energy in the music, and uh, I just love the concept, and I'll be. Uh, using this same concept for the next album also so uh, yeah nice sounds cool and there's a, there's like a bunch of stuff like that that you can derive you know yeah, right? inspiration from and you know the parallels are there for you know how we are living today and how people are acting you know because that's like you said the, it's it's easy to find a comparison and you know just like how people act on social media for instance Oh. is like you're 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 dancing yourself to death with your fucking bullshit that you're yeah. you know like you're you know you're, you're yeah you're joining a mob that's doing something stupid and detrimental in the end yeah. and, and you're just doing it because everybody else is doing it and you want to be a part of a group and that's you know a basic psychological need for all of us 
to yes. be a part of some sort of group, whether it be family or or your metal band or or like a fucking football team. But you need to have roots in some sort of a group that tells you who you are, you know? Yep. And it's yep. baffling to me that so many people want to choose idiots <laughs> as your yep. group <laughs> of choice. Yep. But, you know, it is like the dancing. <laughs> I, I never made that a comparison, but it's interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I can see how, of course, I mean, I'm uh, uh, from from the t time when there was no social media, so right. social media at all. We so did. obviously, so same. Yeah. OK. So, yeah. So and I and I have a daughter, I have three daughters. So the middle one is 10 years old and I have to watch out that she's not on a screen 24 seven. Right. It's mm -hmm. and, and, and but she also reads books and stuff. But if I don't watch out, if I don't uh, pay attention, she'll be on some screen all the time, you know. And um, yeah, um, it's just bizarre to to see how this changed in only like two decades or something. I mean, almost all parents have the same like things they come across, right? But but yeah, but it's it's pretty bizarre to see how this uh, how the, how fast this all went. Uh, it's uh, crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and there's like there's good stuff, obviously. Like you know, the the group of choice is the question here. You know, yeah. social media is great for like you know connecting people that would have never in, in other circumstances or without the social media be able to like form a relationship it's based true. on similar interests or whatever, you know, or, or like peer support, whether it be like, I don't know, cancer, alcoholism, depression, you know, you can find people from around the world that can share your pain and what you're going through and it's going to yeah. be beneficial for you. So it's, it's mostly just about like the group that you choose. It for is. me, it's just yeah. no, yeah, absolutely that agree. so many people are like, ignorance this is good like facts i don't care you know <laughs> like, yeah so so yeah but that's the thing like it's really uh um it can be okay it can be cool but it it um how do you say it's like uh i'm not sure what the english word is a catalysator it can like make things worse very very quickly or or better maybe but i, I mean i i lost like a couple of friends uh, who, who like committed suicide in the past years and it was not because of social media but they were they were having problems and depressions and stuff but social media definitely made it worse definitely made it worse so that's also that's a dark side i guess you know I, if you're in trouble uh, uh with yourself or anything it can be really uh, dangerous also so um yeah good and bad sides to that i guess i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah, because they're like, you know, that you, you want to have media literate people where you can like judge the news that you're reading by who's posted it. What, what are they going after? What's their agenda? But you should all also have like the social media literacy where you know that this this like image that, you know, people are portraying with their happy breakfasts and, and spotless clean children and white couches and shit it's just not real you know <laughs> like it's just not how it fucking works there's gonna be red wine some mummy juice on that fucking couch come 9 p.m and that toddler be down you know definitely, <laughs> like, definitely. That, that's the reality yeah. of it being yeah, completely sure. like frustrated in the in the morning trying to dress dress your toddler and, and blah. Yeah. you know that, that's the reality and, and that's reality like, we're, we're you're not gonna your ass you know <laughs> yeah true true yeah so but um yeah but i'm i'm really uh i mean the, the technology enables us to have this conversation like this okay, which is cool. double-edged sword for sure yeah so that's good yeah so um yeah very very nice well anyway yeah so um do you have any more questions about the project <laughs> Yeah, what? no this is not a show that talks about your music Did you not know <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we uh, we taking it too we, far. Like any minute now, Bruce is going to be asking you whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not. Uh, <laughs> so what do you I have? Know. <laughs> oh, so we're gonna now that you brought it up, it's been here. We're gonna argue that it is definitely a sandwich because okay. it's in two slices of bread. And I know that's not the topic and not where you thought we were going, but definitely a sandwich. Case closed. Uh, I, I do, don't really agree because uh, often a hot dog is a bun with a hole and the sausage goes, it looks perverted. But yeah, that's, I don't know what that, if you're not show, watching, you? go back and watch this because that's true, right? It's true. 
<laughs> in Holland, we have hot dogs, and it's like a bun with a with a sausage inside. It's not like a sandwich, like two halves. That like it's like <laughs> one one thing sausage goes right through it. I wouldn't call that a sandwich, but I'm cool with everything. Uh, I'm <laughs> arguing. Case closed. Hey, you never thought you'd be talking about that here, did you? No. <laughs> anyway, what's next for Corio Manic? Uh, well, hopefully more live shows. So this is. Uh, I was surprised to have this offer today, and I'm I'm going to do a, uh, everything I can to make it happen. And then I have to think about this live show, like I said, and and um, um, reach out to some some promoters and people I know from from around. Um, so so the challenge will be to to um, to reach the right to, the to find the target audience, I guess, because I have never thought about this, but. Like I said, in the metal scene, people are not really into this kind of stuff generally. So, uh, so it would be outside of the metal scene, maybe, or more the experimental side, like people that are into like Mr. Bungle or Fade No More, or uh, you know, more experimental or, or crazy stuff, I guess. So I have to look for for I have to to determine the target audience and then work from there and uh, and see what happens. But um, I'm. Uh, I'm I'm having a great time uh, every step of the way, so so I'll just carry on and see what happens. That's awesome. You got anything yeah. else before we wrap it? Just just want to say I love Mr. Bungle. God damn that band right? is it's great, like, right? You know, it's a fucking awesome band. You know, Disco Volante takes it a little bit too far, <laughs> in my opinion. It's not like it's just like all right, time to chillax at home. Press play on Disco Volante. Not gonna happen. But <laughs> like you know. The, the self-titled album, California, never fucking gets old. I love the video for Pink Cigarette, by the way. It's like something yeah. that I, I like, you know, want to steal the idea and just do it a little bit differently for, for one of my projects or something. But great fucking reference. Great reference. Yeah. So if you're into Mr. Bungle. I, I just... Yeah, I totally love Mr. Bungle. And, and, but, but, and I think because of the freedom, you know, it's like complete freedom. They do whatever they want to do. Or I, I guess it's Mike Pett and his, his party, right? So yeah. he just does what he wants to do. And, and that's like inspiring to me because there are no rules. And, and that's the greatest joy of, of creating music in this case or whatever it is you're creating. It's like the freedom and not having any rules. Just see what happens and then and then it will all fall into place or something, you know? So That is an admirable attitude. Hope that wasn't too bad. I know we kind of <laughs> took it wherever, but that's what we're known to do here. We just kind of go where it goes. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. That's good fun. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Hey, good uh, luck with the record. It. I'm excited for you. It comes out in a couple of days. Uh, anybody listening, go ahead and grab it. And we'll talk to you soon, my friend. Awesome. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks. Lovely meeting you. Yeah. Have a nice day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like? Or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effie Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. Oh.